Okay, thanks very much, Greg. We're going to move on to our next talk. Uh, Dr. Brian Unwin uh, will uh, talk to us now about uh, <clears throat> normal aging versus dementia. What's happening to me? Dr. Unwin. Thanks. So the overall conference uh, had part of the title, The Good, Bad, and the Ugly, and I guess I'm, I'm the ugly um, <laughs> at the end of that. Uh, so that's me, and um, we'll go from there. I thought I'd put a population stamp on this, basically showing that uh, an older population is going to be part of our community. Uh, if you do the quick math, you're looking at about 50,000 people will be over the age of 65 in year 2040. And if you do the math and look at the uh, demographics and all, about 10,000 of those individuals in 2040 will have dementia. And the population over the age of 85, so uh, let's call it about 7,800 7, or so, the over 85 population is a very important, to me, important population to me as a geriatrician because those are the people that have the greatest need for assistance. That population of people are the people that are having the falls and the disablement and the problems that occur in late life. So this is a, this is a big deal. And so, uh, and that's just in our community. The big picture uh, you heard about earlier, uh, what is the key to successful aging? The Okinawans, the ethnic Sardinians, and the Seventh-day Adventists teach us that if you don't smoke, if you have a, an active family, uh, putting family first, keeping your social connections, being physically active every day, and remaining socially engaged and eating well, You'll be that guy. <laughs> I promise you. Let's rethink this based upon the previous lecture. If you think about those things right there, you're creating connections. You're creating those synapses that we talked about just a few minutes ago. And maybe you're not destroying them with your diet or bad habits. Connection between clinical science and the basic sciences. This is a uh, mortality curve, if you, a survival curve. Basically, uh, everyone, when you're born, is alive, and then we all die. Uh, back when we were cavemen, uh, we died off pretty rapidly because we had saber-toothed tigers and diseases and things that were killing us off left, right, and center. And you know, people survived, but not many to advanced age. But when we changed our environment, and we started gathering together as tribes and building huts and fences and fighting off diseases and doing all those kinds of things, we started dying later from things related to aging and degeneration. And we all, is anyone going to be surprised if I say we're all gonna die? No, oh, just checking, I have to check my audience. We're all gonna die, but generally speaking, death occurs in late life in, in the modern world in developed countries. Another way of putting some of what you just saw, this is a, uh, this is a, a combination of a uh, survival curve up top, mortality curve here, aging over time, and it basically says that with normal aging, and if we were to improve our environments with our healthcare, and having home, and food, and housing, and clean water, and safe places to live, we are going to hit, we're pretty much there, in terms of our life expectancy. It will only get longer if we do something to our genetics or we do something dramatically different in terms of our nutritional intake, what's called caloric or dietary restriction. And this difference that you see there, we could potentially live up to 122 years. And you saw this on National Geographic. I love National Geographic. But that baby, born in, I think, Okinawan baby, could live to 120. And there are a lot of really interesting things that um, we possess in our genome that potentially could get us to that point because some ethnic groups have different genetic powers, superpowers, if you will, that maybe help them overcome and fight cancer better than other people or another group of people may have a, a predisposition, predisposition for longer lifespans, or may uh, fight diseases better than others. 
And you could say to yourself, well, if we could harness that in positive, ethical, productive ways, and I hope we can get there, um, then maybe good things could happen if we enhanced our genetic environment. This is honestly the most important slide that I want you to work, walk away with today. Um, this is based upon an epidemiologic study of aging that basically says that survival is based upon function. And if you can preserve your function and keep your function normal, you're probably gonna live well. But if you lose your strength, you lose function. And if you lose too much strength, you become frail, and once again, you die. And I'm not being flippant with that. I, please understand that. But we, it's, if we can preserve function, we preserve our strengths, we can age successfully, despite the medical problems we may have. Despite the problems that you have. So I want you to think about someone that you've lost, someone who has passed. And you think about that person in their entirety. And I ask you to think about their physical strength. Or maybe they had organ problems like liver disease, or uh, lung disease, or heart disease. Or maybe they had dementia. These are things within the human body that we, you know, I kind of own those things for me, okay? My cognitive, emotional, physical strength is something that I own. But when your loved one was fighting their condition, how did they cope and what emotional strengths did they use to push back against their problems? Or was that a problem? What kind of social supports, family supports, uh, club supports, insurance, money, what helped them socially preserve their function? And their meaning of life. Some people use the word spirituality. But as long as you have meaning in life, I think it was Nietzsche that said, if you, have, if you know the why you are living, you'll figure out the how. If you can preserve these six strengths and the interplay between these six things, you might have heart failure and you might have this kind of medical problem and this kind of medical problem, but if you put your mind to work and learn about it and fight and build up your physical strength and turn to your family and keep your meaning in life and keep your energy forward, you're going to maintain your function. I want you to remember this slide because taking care of yourself for healthy aging is not just about your brain, it's about your body, and it's about your social networking, and it's about your physical fitness and the relationships that keep you and allow you to successfully age. You could look at this, I think, is summarized in this in terms of a, a holistic approach to aging, or you could take a reductionist approach to aging and in my world view, 95% of healthcare spending goes to that. And if you, didn't, if you, you want to come back to that, 70% 70 of our medical problems are due to lifestyle and behavior. I gave away my gag slide. Don't smoke cigarettes, OK? And, it's never, and don't be Homer Simpson. Don't be Homer Simpson. Smoking, alcohol, drugs, abuse, abusing your body, bad things, exercising, good sleep, quality of life, being knowledgeable about your health conditions, those keep you functioning and healthy and maximally uh, uh, functional. So you came here to understand, well, what's wrong with me if I've got memory problems? Well, uh, this is the ugly part. This is the data. One in two women, one in three men, over the age of 65, after that, that's your risk of having these problems. Now, that does not mean that you are going to be the gentleman in a nursing home. It does not mean that you are going to have this awful problem. But that may, it means that that will be part of your experience as you go through late life. 
I hope those numbers get smaller. But turning away from that and realizing that our brain is wearing down with, with us as we age, to turn our way from that, please don't. You have to wrestle with it. So what is normal aging? Normal aging is this, word finding. And I've counted so far, I think I've had four or five word things that I didn't like in my talk to you. But I hopefully rallied and you didn't notice a thing, okay? <laughs> But you know, you'll have difficulty word finding, and I'm not as good at multitasking as my wife, who's the same age as I am, but you know, it's, she's slowed down a little bit. And maybe your attention span is off a little bit than it used to, that's why I'm walking around. I keep myself awake when I do this. Um, but you can learn new things. You can create new memories. You do maintain your language and memory skills and your vocabulary, and you maintain your function. Dementia is a problem with function, not memory. I want to hammer that, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. So this is maybe the second or third most important slide. I lose track of things. Normal age-related forgetfulness, you'll see this here. I believe the slide deck is going to be available to participants of the program. But you occasionally search for a word. You may forget about something from the past, but then it comes back. You know, you may you know, have your routine of turning right to go to work, and then it's Saturday and you, you go left to go to the grocery store, but you turned right instead. You have that little hiccup. And that's all it is. It doesn't, you recognize your problem, you turn around, you go do what you need to do. That's normal aging. Mild cognitive impairment is that you're beginning to have some functional impairments. You're aware of it, or maybe people are making you aware of it but it's not completely shutting you down and you're able to adapt and, and adjust. But you're saying to yourself, I'm off, but I'm still functioning. But dementia, you're not remembering who your daughter is. I just came back from a house call, you're not remembering that $26,000 check you just wrote to someone that you don't know. You have impaired short-term memory and you're not able to learn new things. And one of the things that I look for is, can the person adapt? And so if the person's forgetting appointments, but then adapting and putting things on the calendar, yay, that's adaptive. But if you can't adapt, that's a problem. What is dementia in a personal way? Alzheimer's Association asked William Uttermolen, who is a portraiture artist, to do self-portraits of himself beginning in 1996 when he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. This is his self-portraiture, self-portrait in 1967. Here he is in 96. They asked him to do it every year as long as he could. And he died in 2000. Those connections, when we look at our loved one that may have dementia, what are they seeing? And I can honestly look you in the face and say, I don't know. But this is what William Uttermullen was seeing when we asked him to draw. This is the impact at a personal level, and there's obviously a greater family and social impact beyond that. So this definition of dementia is really important because it's about this when you are having difficulty functioning at your prior level of function, that could be normal aging, but when you go out to groceries and you wind up in Biloxi, Mississippi, true story, that's a problem, okay? It's problems with reasoning and complex tasks and judgment. It can be problems with language and visual spatial abilities and acquisition of new knowledge and information and attention span and changes in personality. And the thing is, everyone, the, the person that I did this house call on today, you would walk by her in the street, you'd meet her in clinic, and you'd say to yourself, I want to be her when I'm 88. After about four or five minutes, you realize that there are some problems going on here with a deeper look. Her superpower was her, her social grace, her language skills. She's just a wonderful, delightful lady, but the other problems there 
the things that were not preserved were the issue. Another way of hammering this home, and, I, I, and uh, uh, to drive this point home, it must interfere with your work and social activities. The fact that I turned right instead of left and I caught myself and I went to the grocery store and got everything, I, that's normal, that's okay. But if you keep driving to work realizing and you're at work and it's Saturday and you're not supposed to be at work and why are you at work? Oh, I'm supposed to be at the grocery store. That's a problem. It's a decline from prior level of uh, performance. It's not related to delirium or a psychiatric disorder. And we want an informant or a family member or someone knowing who knows the person to tell us more about the patient. Because often we hear that everything's fine. So again, putting this in red, these are the big changes that occur. There are different types of dementia, and I don't want people to get stuck on that, what type of dementia. And in many ways, I will tell you, and I'm not being lazy in saying this, it doesn't matter. What matters about dementia and, make, and trying to get the diagnosis right is that it helps us predict and help the family what to expect in the future, what behaviors might come and be an issue, or what medications to maybe prescribe or avoid. But to get into the, we must get a diagnosis, we must get a uh, scan or something like that, clinically speaking, most of the time, it's not critical. The mimics of dementia are really important that we address uh, as clinicians, and I put the big ones up there, and it's depression. It's a whole other layer of depression when you are 85 years old and your spouse of 65 years has passed. Wow. You know, I don't have a pill for that. I don't have words for that. But I will walk with you and try to help you through that. But depression in late life, big issue. Missing hypothyroidism and uh, uh, Hypothyroidism is a really simple thing to treat, as well as B12 deficiency and folate deficiency, and people can rally around that. And there are some other rare things that can crop up as a mimic to dementia, um, but it's important that you and your clinicians explore these things, you know, to make sure that these are not issues that are easily treated. Busy slide, but here's the walk away. This is a frequency, 100% frequency, and uh, months before the diagnosis of dementia at time zero and months after the diagnosis of dementia. And it boils down to this. People are having behavior changes and memory changes three, four, five years before the person walks into our clinic at time zero. And, when it, and at time zero, when the family and patient are coming into clinic, you know, there's a whole lot of drama going on in the house. You don't love me anymore. There's someone stealing from me. There are, there, the, the, there are people coming through the walls. When people come to us as clinicians, it's often very late in the stage of the game. And often what happens is that people are ascribing these things over here, that's normal aging. No, it's not. See your doctor, Talk it, walk through that and see what's going on. When you come to my clinic, I want to try to figure out with you with what's going on. And so I'm going through this little, I call it the wheel of fortune. I, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> I've got to come up with a new name. But what I'm doing is I'm doing a chart review, meeting the patient, examining the patient, and I'm saying, OK, what's not going on? And I'm saying, well, you haven't had a brain injury and you don't have small strokes or large strokes, and your thyroid's good, your B12's good, uh, you don't, you've never eaten brain, human brains in Borneo, that is a real disease, um, and you, your medications are good, and you don't have large strokes, but your vision and hearing, how come you don't wear hearing aids? Why aren't you adapting to poor hearing? And 80% of 80-year-olds have meaningful hearing loss. And how do you learn and adapt to new things? And how do you learn things? Vision, hearing. 
take care of these two things. Who here wears glasses? Hey! Would you dream of coming to this without your glasses? No. How many of you have been told you should wear uh, hearing aids? Don't raise your hands. What was that? <laughs> huh? What? <laughs> but what I do then is I start saying, well, let's talk about this depression. And yes, normal aging is part of this. And your medical problems do contribute to that white matter change that you are suffering from. Vascular disease phenomenon, things that hurt your heart, things that cause stroke, things that hurt your kidney are the things that hurt your white matter those synapses and connections you learned about. And yeah, I think you got Alzheimer's disease. Busy slide. But basically it's telling us that things that injure your brain trigger a cascade of things that can result in degeneration of the connections that we've been talking about today. And there are all kinds of neurotransmitters that are involved that maybe we could manipulate and change and treat to maybe improve the chemical connections between the synapses or maybe get synapses to grow. And there's a lot of wonderful research going on with this. But the truth of the matter is since about the year 2000, there are two classes of medicines that are used to treat Alzheimer's disease, two. There are, I think at last count, 12 classes of medicines to treat diabetes. There are two for Alzheimer's disease. There's a lot of work to be done. And regarding neurotransmitters, I'll, I'm gonna be honest with you. The best that the medicines that will do, Aricept or Namenda, the medicines that you hear about, the best they will do is slow things down. You will not recover, re recover function. You will not recover memory. It will not make you better. And I'm sorry. We can do better. And what can we do to make it better? Participate in research. Join a clinical trial. Go to the Alzheimer's Association. Join us on the walk this year. Sorry, that was a pitch. Um, <laughs> contribute to research and help fight this, fight this problem. Here are the threats to your brain, and I want to check my time here. I'm going to take maybe five minutes, and I can get through this. He took, he took, he, he got, a, he had a little extra. So you know Ben Franklin, okay? You know Ben Franklin. Uh, don't be the person that dies at 25, uh, or you know, and then gets buried at 75. Don't be that person. These are the things that hurt your brain. Um, isolation is really. Key, and I, and I should maybe move that up to the top of the list, but when you think about the way you make connections, you make connections personally, in relationships, joining clubs and organizations, contributing as volunteers, all kinds of cool things happen with social relationships. Magic happens. Have that active body, and if you want a great website, join the Growing Boulder little wordplay there, growingbolder.com, I think it is. And they have a lot of great inspirational messages for older adults. I personally, in this photo, I like the shot put lady up there. I just am scared of her. I don't, and the lady throwing the javelin also has my attention. I wanna be this guy. I wanna be the guy on the, on the sidecar hanging it out there. Don't be this gal. Exercise, exercise. Now you're laughing with me now, but look at this slide. This is broken out over time. It is not changed out from 2006 to 2019, but it basically reflects a percent of people in their age cohort that are regularly exercising. Roughly speaking, 45 to 64 year olds, one third exercise regularly. And it only goes down there as you get older. Now you could say to yourself, there are a lot of reasons for that. Maybe, well, maybe, but maybe not. When do you need the best strength that you could ever need in life? After you break your hip. And the person you need more than a doctor at that point in time are the two ladies down here. 
representing physical therapy, occupational therapy. We work together at our, at our nursing home. You need them more than you need me. You need to exercise to stay strong so that you can be strong when your body is taxed at late life. To preserve that function when function is being pulled from you. Physical activity is perhaps the most important thing you can do, and some argue it's better than stopping smoking. Ah. Okay? It both prevents disease and treats disease. If you come to me for depression treatment, the first thing that it will come out of my mouth is what are you doing for exercise? And the science behind exercise for treatment of, condition, of conditions, phenomenal, okay? <laughs> this lady, uh, we were doing a house call. I was in the Army for 30 years. We were doing a house call on this lady. She started, she was never an athlete. She started doing exercise at 65, but she just said, I'm gonna do Senior Olympics. And she did Senior Olympics for the next 30 years, and this is her trophy room. Uh, you can't see the other walls, but it is exactly with all these medals here, and there's a photo of her throwing the javelin. Uh, that's Dr. Hall, we did this house call together. Um, her issue, I had a fall, I'm worried, and I wanna make sure I'm okay. And what we found with that, she had important, unrecognized dementia. But boy, she had superpowers, and we put them to work. Those other strengths, her cognition was weakening, but she had a lot of other strengths to put to work to help her survive and thrive. Great website for the older adult, the Go For Life program, sponsored by the National Institute of Aging. This is the core of it. Wonderful evidence-based exercises designed for older adults, not the 20-somethings, to help you stay strong, preserve your aerobic, physical strength, your, your, uh, your weight-bearing skills, as well as your balance skills. If you want to learn more about healthy aging, this was a life-changing book to me. Uh, George Valiant's uh, report on the Harvard Grant study, where basically they looked at a longitudinal study of aging that is currently ongoing. And what they found with this longitudinal study on aging, the most comprehensive, wonderful study in my view ever, is that these things here do more to, pre to pre do more and predict successful aging more, I'm going to be struck by lightning, than your cholesterol or your blood pressure. Having a good marriage at 50 predicts successful aging. Being a lifelong, nurturing, loving relationship predicts successful aging. Intergenerational relationships, younger friends, good for you. Why is that? If you're 95 and all of your 95-year-old friends have passed, you're kind of shorthanded. <laughs> but if you've got 75-year-old friends and they've got 55-year-old daughters and they've got 35-year-old sons that teach you all the new lingo and the stuff on the apps, on the phone, and on the da, you're good to go. It helps build connections. Wonderful book, again, if you want, Aging Well by George Valiant. What can you do today? Pick one thing of the things that we've talked about. Maybe it's stopping smoking. Maybe you're saying, I'm going to start exercising. Maybe I am going to start going back to my club. Maybe I will start reengaging with my church community. Maybe I'll do this. But pick one thing. Set a start date. Tell someone that you are going to do this good thing. And set out and do it. Tell your friends about it. Let them help you. You help them with their goals of what they want to do. And support research and support senior services. Because that's the way we're going to make the world better for all of us in our collective future. Some general resources you'll see there. Another great book to put a different spin on this. What can you do because you have aged? What can you do? What have you done because you've aged? And that is a positive attitude. Great book by Jane Cohen. Live long and prosper. <laughs>
Thank you, Brian. So, uh, we have a, f a few minutes for questions. I'd like to ask Dr. Valdez and Dr. Unwin to come back up, and the floor is open. Why don't you both come up here, and I'll, I'll we're only, We're only 10 over. If you have a question, as always, please stand up. Yes? Uh, two questions. Stand up. Your question, please, sir. Okay. Um, one when will there be a cure, and two, is there Uh, uh, cure, uh, I am hoping there'll be better treatments. Um, I am hoping that those will roll out in five to 10 years. I'm sorry. Yeah, with a cure, we just, uh, there's no way to put a stamp on time. Uh, the research is incredibly complicated in the nervous system. You mentioned diabetes, cancer. Those are tractable areas of the body. We can gain access to those places of the body. We can model those diseases in animals pretty relatively easy. We can't ask an animal whether they're cognitive imp cognitively impaired or not. So the brain is just a completely different beast. And so we just simply can't. And then for medicines that are potentially, potentially <coughs> injurious, because medicines that I'm going to mention can be of great value to the individual. Um, anything that sedates, dries you up, uh, or um, slows you down are potentially harmful in, uh, medicines to the brain. So those would be things like, yes, antihistamines. Valium-like medicines, muscle relaxants uh, are the, uh, you know, if, again, if you see me in clinic, I'm, I'm hunting for those things and, you know, take a, you know, I take them out, you know, and I try to avoid those medicines. However, if you are an individual that needs those medicines for your quality of life, for your best function, then those medicines should be preserved and continued. It is an individualized decision with you and your doctor, not by anything I've said today. It's just one of those, take a time out, does this add value? If it does, go with it. Um, I do not know about meditation per se. I would argue that those that do practice that um, probably embrace wellness and a holistic approach, and I would envision that that is positive, but I do not know of specific studies for that. Yeah, but the, it would be a good thing. The, the, I, you know, the, don't, don't quote me on this. There, there, there have been some studies with monks, med meditation, I don't recall exactly what the outcome of those studies. I do remember generally that they were positive. Meditation is positive, but um, this harmony in brain waves and, and you know, the balancing of the right and left. That's that's right. Yep. Um, specifically, you talk about nutrition a lot. Are there big no's like diet sodas and <laughs> <laughs> Don't go to White House dinners. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> That's my bet. Yeah, the, the American diet is the worst diet. Uh, the Mediterranean diet has uh, good evidence behind it. The DASH diet has good evidence behind it. Uh, a new one, uh, a new diet uh, called the um, uh, MIND diet, M-I-N-D diet, uh, which is a variation on the Mediterranean diet. Again, heavy on uh, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, limited red meats, fat and greasy no uh, kind of diet. And, and those are all, if you were to go to the uh, uh, Nutrition Society, uh, the American, Soci American Society of Nutrition, yeah, nutrition. Medicine or something like that would be a great resource to learn about that. Hmm. Uh, you're, uh, I'll let you define it. You're the MD. So, dementia, <laughs> I use the analogy of, of uh, dementia is like the word automobile. It's a bucket term that describes the phenomenon that you saw there of 
problems with memory, reasoning, and concentration. Then Alzheimer's disease is a subset of that. So automobile, Ford, and then Chevy, et cetera. So Alzheimer's disease, about two thirds of all causes of dementia, and then vascular dementia where the brain has been injured from stroke is number two, a combination of things, uh, mixed dementia, three, and then there are dementias related to uh, what's called Lewy body disease, frontal temporal dementia, other rarer forms. But it's a type of dementia. Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. The back. Are they available? Did I misspeak? I, I think he was referring to a, a website, I thought, a link or... Yeah. Yeah. These slides. Yeah. Okay. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> uh, Uh-oh, shot myself in the foot. Um, I will, those are, if those you are wanted available. to make them available, <laughs> uh, we would put them on the website of the Research Institute if a speaker would like to make them available. You could just Google that. But I have to leave that to each speaker, basically. Jed, what about the videos? The, all the videos from each day of brain school will be on the, uh, on the research institute yeah. YouTube site as well. So these are being recorded <coughs> right now. You can rewatch the video at the website and, and you'll see the slides. I just thought you meant getting access to take the slides, but no. Uh, just in front of you there, yeah, in the back, right? Yes? How much does you? <laughs> Zero to yours. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> because it's too repetitive, as you end up doing the same thing. And so you have to have variation on your interactions with individuals uh, on your daily activity. So. And getting outside and being with people. Now, could you say that it? Does it have a role and can it contribute and does it add value for the, the shut-in or the shut-in that wants to communicate and be with family remotely? Absolutely, but to have that, to have social media or Jerry Springer as your only other person in your house, <laughs> So, I, so you're not, I'm not going to get invited back. So, so with aging, there's, some, there's something called cognitive reserve and doing the same thing, listening to the same people, exchanging the same ideas that you all agree with is detrimental. Cognitive reserve, you only increase it by having ver variety in your life. Absolutely. Commissioner? So one of you uh, mentioned the importance of not falling. <laughs> I don't know if, if there is a direct link or it, that, that, that direct link has been established with individuals that have fallen and the severity of the injury that came with it and Alzheimer's disease. I can only tell you what I think of it generally without knowing whether there is or not data out there is that when you fall and you have an injury, like I did a couple of, uh, about a year ago and I tore a couple of, of ligaments there's a huge inflammatory response, mm -hmm. and that goes everywhere in your body, it's, it's certainly into your nervous system, and that activates certain cells that we know eat up your synapses. And so that can certainly contribute to the disappearance of a lot of those connections. And to just add to that, um, the prodrome, uh, the, those early symptoms that might have been missed or disregarded or not recognized prior to the fall, the patient had dementia, but it wasn't showing and evident. The fall, and then the delirium, which is a distinct phenomenon, the sudden acute change in cognitive abilities and cognitive status and orientation and reasoning skills, that's delirium. That's a different thing. When I see a person with delirium, 90% of the time I'm looking at a person that preceding that probably had dementia. And so um, the recovery after the fall then is complicated by 
the cognitive abilities to learn new ways of adapting to a cane, a walker, walking, etc. The outcome of rehab is to restore best possible safe function. Okay, I think I know there's more questions, but I realize that we've gone a little bit past our time. So I think in light of the hour, <clears throat> we're going to have to call it tonight. Please join me in thanking uh, both of our speakers, Dr. Valdez and Dr. Anna. And uh, I also want to thank all the speakers for this week. A couple of them are here, so thanks to them. And thanks to all of you for coming. You've been a great audience. And thanks to our staff, uh, including many people who put this all together, working behind the scenes tirelessly, and to our great caterers, Chanticleer, and everybody else who made this happen. Thank you all very much.